Hello fellow bibliophiles and welcome back to Blatantly Bookish. I'm Marissa and today I am very excited to chat with you about some of my favorite books of 2020. This is one of my favorite videos to film each year. It's so fun to reflect on what I've read the past year and pick some of the standouts to discuss with you guys. This year's selection was particularly difficult for me to put together. I read more books than usual that resonated with me and that I still think about months after reading them. So for the sake of my sanity, this list is not ranked. I'm just going to talk about these books more or less in the order that I read them this past year because it took me half of January to put this list together and it might be 2022 by the time I figure out some system to rank these wonderful books. Seriously, I don't know how some booktubers do it. They rank the books, they pick a favorite for the year. That just doesn't seem to be possible for me. With a few exceptions, these books were not published this year. This list also doesn't include books I reread this year simply because any book I take the time to reread is amazing and it would just serve to make this list much, much longer if I were to add them all. So with that said, on to my favorites of 2020. The first book I have for you guys is A Passage to India by E.M. Forster. This is the second E.M. Forster book that I've read and it definitely solidified my love for Forster's writing. There's something so subtle and beautiful about the way he writes. His dialogue is brilliant and I see a lot of similarities between his works and Jane Austen's writing, which coming from me is a compliment of the highest order. This book is a fantastic exploration of the clash between cultures and prejudice and racism. It takes place under the British rule of India and it follows both native British characters who have relocated to India as well as characters of Indian descent. We are immediately drawn to two British women who share a desire to see the real India rather than this watered down British version of India that most British natives happily surround themselves with. These women befriend a Muslim doctor who takes them on an expedition to the historic Marabar Caves. And on this trip, a scandal happens, which exacerbates the already fraught race relations and affects everyone involved. This book has such wonderful, complex, and nuanced views of race and culture, and it shows that virtually no character is truly blameless and unbiased in their actions and thoughts. And this book doesn't just explore the conflict between British and Indian ideologies, but it explores the inherent divisions and prejudices that also exist between the Muslims and Hindus within India at the time. This book is such a brilliant look at the gulf between people of different races and cultures and the difficulties of interpersonal relationships, as well as the effects of imperialism on society. It's a captivating and intriguing read, and just talking about it is making me want to read some more E.M. Forster, so I will have to do that this year. The next book I have is The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow by Natasha Pulley. I almost didn't include this book because it's part of a series, and so as much as I loved it, you have to have at least read The Watchmaker of Filigree Street before getting to this book. But I did end up deciding to include it anyway because this book was utterly amazing and I had such a fun experience reading it. Like I said, it's a direct sequel to Natasha Pulley's first book, The Watchmaker of Filigree Street, and it takes place five years later than that book. So it takes place in 1880s Japan. It follows the same main characters as The Watchmaker of Filigree Street. Faneuil Steepleton and Kata Mori both have business in Japan, and a series of strange happenings occur there. People in the British Foreign Legion claim to see ghosts, and there are peculiar electric storms, not to mention a strange abundance of owls. The reader and Thaniel struggle to piece together all of these peculiarities, but meanwhile, Maury seems to know more than he's letting on about the situation. However, he can't or won't tell us. The plot of this book is so intricate and so perfect. On reading The Watchmaker of Filigree Street, I didn't think it needed a sequel, but this was done to perfection, and now I can't 
imagine not having this follow-up to that first book. Because it's a sequel, I realize I've been rather cryptic and vague in discussing it, but I would say that if you like historical fiction that incorporates some elements of magical realism, you will love Natasha Pulley's writing. She just strikes that perfect balance between historical accuracy and supernatural or magical elements in her text. Her writing is detailed and intricate, and it has a striking similarity to the best Victorian authors. I just, I can't recommend her work enough. The next book I have for you is Miss Austen by Jill Hornby. This book is historical fiction, and it centers on a different Miss Austen than you might be expecting. It centers not on Jane Austen, but on her sister, Cassandra Austen. Years after Jane's death, Cassandra finds Jane's letters, which she collects and then destroys, as she is so famous for doing in real life. Cassandra reflects on her younger self and her memories and her rich past with Jane. This book looks at Cassandra not as a side character to her famous sister, but as a heroine in her own right, with her own fascinating life and set of experiences and influences on other people. This book deals with themes of privacy, family, spinsterhood, legacy, and it looks at grief in really interesting ways as well. It's a phenomenal and subtle book full of respect and admiration for Jane Austen's life, legacy, and her body of work. It is so beautifully done, and if you're a fan of historical fiction or you just love Jane Austen, I can't recommend this book enough. I also did a much more in-depth review about this book that you should check out if you're interested in hearing more details on this one. I'm pretty proud of that review actually, so I'll just go link that in the description. Another Jane Austen related book that I read and loved this year is The Other Bennet Sister by Janice Hadlow. Like Miss Austen, this is another book that is a must read for any Jane Austen fan. And in some ways, it's actually the perfect counterpoint to Miss Austen. I feel like the two books have a very different vibe from each other, but taken together, they perfectly encapsulate everything that I love about Austen's work and legacy. The Other Bennet Sister is a Pride and Prejudice retelling that focuses on the much overlooked Mary Bennet. Mary is smug and sanctimonious and rather unlikable in Pride and Prejudice. She's definitely overshadowed by her elder sisters in both charisma and importance, but this book brings her to life as the heroine of her own Austen-esque tale. This book begins with the familiar plot of Pride and Prejudice, but it quickly progresses past the end of Austen's original narrative. The strengths of this book come from Hadlow's deep understanding of Austen's own themes and her work's best qualities. Hadlow shares Austen's ability to portray nuanced emotional depth, and she remains true to Austen's characters while adding her own interpretations. This book managed to recapture the feeling I had when reading an original Austen book for the first time. And that is no small feat and is definitely the reason that it makes this list and is definitely a good reason to pick this up. Since finishing this book, I've thought about it quite a bit and I've even obtained this copy of my own, which is now part of my treasured Jane Austen shelf. Next up is The Five by Hallie Rubenhold. This is a fantastic piece of nonfiction all about the lives of Jack the Ripper's five most famous victims. Rather than focusing on their horrible deaths though, it looks at their lives and uses their stories as a lens to examine some less talked about topics about Victorian society and gender. The author challenges the idea that these women were prostitutes or worked in the sex trade at all. Instead, she focuses on their struggles with mental illness, addiction, and poverty. She looks at syphilis, workhouses, infant mortality, the female alcoholic. I've read a considerable amount of nonfiction books about the Victorian era at this point, but this book discusses themes that aren't usually addressed, or if they're mentioned, they take up a chapter or two, not the entirety of the book. This book is such a captivating and interesting exploration of gender and poverty in the Victorian era, and it's well worth the read if you're interested in that subject matter. And next I have The Odd Women by George Gissing. The Odd Woman is a piece of Victorian literature that actually pairs quite nicely with The Five. 
Both books discuss gender and class in the Victorian era in interesting ways, and they look at women who, for one reason or other, were outcasts in Victorian society. The Odd Woman is a surprisingly proto-feminist work of Victorian fiction that deals with gender roles and women's rights and changing positions in England. It looks at the odd women in society. Not odd like strange, but odd meaning uncoupled or unpaired, basically unmarried women. In the late Victorian period, when The Odd Woman was published, there began to be increased opportunities for unmarried women. The Odd Woman looks at various single women and how they cope with spinsterhood and find meaningful places for themselves in a society that typically doesn't value their lifestyles. And in looking at single women, it also becomes a fascinating exploration and critique of marriage as an institution. It's a really brilliant and unusual piece of Victorian literature in the way that it looks at gender and class. And it has some brilliant characters. I am particularly fond of Rhoda Nunn. She's so stubborn and self-assured, and she's just such a delight to read about. Next, I have The Glass Hotel by Emily St. John Mandel. This book is so wonderful and so weird. It's about a Ponzi scheme reminiscent of Bertie Madoff's, and it follows a host of characters from different socioeconomic backgrounds whose lives have all been affected by this fraud. It's a story about the unexpected connections between people and the way that that brief intersection and overlap of their lives can be so impactful. It's about the choices we make and how they can affect the directions that our lives take. And it addresses all of the choices that we didn't act on, all of those alternate realities which could have been but weren't, the potential selves that were never realized. It's a book about greed, ambition, regret, and guilt. Reading this book is like being trapped in this hazy, dreamlike state with fragmented bits of reality. You grasp at these bits of beautifully woven prose and characters that just don't seem to fit together, but eventually they come together perfectly in the most unexpected of ways. This book should not work, but it does, and the way this book is written is like nothing I've ever read before. I can't recommend it highly enough. The next book I want to talk about is Stamped from the Beginning by Ibram X. Kendi. This is another nonfiction book. I think this year's best books list has the most nonfiction books I've ever included on a favorites list. Anyway, this book is one of the most impressive pieces of nonfiction that I've ever read. It takes on the monumental task of reframing American history from the perspective of racist and anti-racist ideas. The main idea behind this book is that today's society has been shaped by both racist and anti-racist ideology. It acknowledges that historical figures who are typically revered for their progressive actions also innately harbored and internalized racist tendencies because they were a part of a racist society. It's just this masterful piece of nonfiction that follows the evolution of ideas over time and shows us how our current society is the product of this evolution of racist and anti-racist ideas. It follows the lives of five narrators from the pre-revolutionary sermons of Cotton Mathers through the Revolutionary War and Thomas Jefferson to abolitionist era William Lloyd Garrison, to World War I and World War II and W.E.B. Du Bois, and the Civil Rights Movement and Angela Davis, right up to the Obama era. This book takes a hard look at our country's past and our relationship with racial disparity. It's through the past and these narrators that we're given a foundation to better unpack race in the modern era. This book was dense and detailed, and I felt like I only took away a fraction of what it had to offer. But even that fraction was worth the read. I wish I could have studied this book in school. I feel like it could be a springboard for an entire course. So if you haven't read this one, I highly recommend that you do so. And if you're daunted by its length and its density as I was, I suggest listening to it on audiobook because I found that that really did help and that I still gained something from the experience of listening to it. 
The next book I'd like to talk about is Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. This book is all about the fictional character of Janie Crawford, a 40-year-old African-American woman as she recounts her life story to her friend Phoebe. Janie has just returned to the town of Eatonville after running off with a younger man, but her narrative to Phoebe begins even earlier than that. We learn about Janie's family, her mother, her grandmother, and her upbringing. We follow Janie as she finds her own voice and shapes her own destiny, despite the expectations thrust upon her by society and previous generations. The beauty of this book is that Janie's formative years never seem to end. She is constantly shaping and discovering herself. There's so much complexity to this narrative. Generations and layers of stories being told through Janie and her actions. And there's this complexity to Janie's voice, too. She has this internal voice that's gorgeous poetic prose, which is constantly contrasted with her dialogue and external voice, which is a southern dialect with conjunctions and slang and its own rules of syntax and grammar. And there's such a beauty in this duality, because Janie is this brilliant amalgamation of the two. This book is gorgeous on so many levels, the writing, the way it explores its themes, and the intersections of race and gender. This is another one on the list that I enjoyed so much that I now own a copy. Next, I have Little Dorrit by Charles Dickens. I forget how much I love Dickens sometimes because his books seem so long and daunting, but they're also so fun and enjoyable and he creates the best cast of characters in his works. Little Dorrit is about the character of Amy Dorrit, also called Little Dorrit. Her father is imprisoned in the Marshalsea Debtors Prison, and his finances are such a tangled mess that it seems that he will never be released. Little Dorrit was born in the Marshalsea Prison, and she takes care of her father and brother and sister and the whole family, really, financially and otherwise. She's the strong and responsible one in the family, and she supports them by working as a seamstress for an invalid named Mrs. Clenham. The book actually begins with Mrs. Mrs. Clenham's son, Arthur Clenham, returning from abroad, and the main plot threads of the book follow Little Dorrit trying to take care of her family and Arthur Clenham, adjusting to life back in England and taking an interest in Amy Dorrit's well-being. It's Dickens, so of course there are all these wonderful plot threads and quirky characters. I love all the twists and turns of this plot. There are fascinating characters like Panks and Daniel Doyce and Affery and so many other minor characters that I fell in love with. There's Mr. Myrtle's plotline, which is fascinating, and I love the friendship between Little Dorrit and Arthur Clenham. At first, Arthur is kind of patronizing towards Amy and wants to protect her, but Amy is proud and clever and self-sufficient, and she rejects his help. I love the relationship between Little Dorrit and her father, how she's so proud of him, but she also recognizes that outside of the Marshall Sea, he doesn't command very much respect, and she understands how her home, the Marshall Sea, is stigmatized in society. This is such a brilliant book that brings together a beautiful balance of plot, character development, and intricate themes in the way that only Dickens can. And then we have The Half-Sisters by Geraldine Jewsbury. The Half-Sisters is a fairly obscure piece of Victorian literature, but I absolutely loved it. It centers around two half-sisters, as the title suggests. There's Alice, who is a rather conventional and respectable wife, but she's deeply dissatisfied with her dull domestic existence. And then there's Bianca, who is half Italian and an unmarried actress. The book looks at the women's contrasting lives and fates, how Alice struggles with her boredom of life, how Bianca struggles with society's perceptions and prejudices towards her lifestyle. This book is rather radical for the Victorian era, and I love the way it looks at the relationship of women and work, and the way it examines Victorian morality. I found the writing to be rather easy to read and surprisingly modern for a Victorian novel. And I highly recommend this book if you like Victorian literature and if you can get a hold of it. 
This book is out of print, so it's really not the easiest to obtain, unfortunately, um, but it's such a brilliant book, and I wish it could come back into print so everyone could read it again. Next, I have And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie. I love Agatha Christie mysteries, and this is probably my favorite one that I've read so far. It's about a group of 10 strangers who are invited as guests for the weekend to a private island off the coast of Devon. They were all assembled together under various pretenses, and it soon becomes clear that they collectively don't actually know who owns this house or who brought them all together. It turns out that they have one very important thing in common. They are each marked to be murdered. And over the course of the weekend, they begin to drop, one by one, each murdered according to a famous nursery rhyme, which hangs in each room of the mansion. Who invited them? And who is murdering them? And who can they trust? This book is full of everything that I love about a good mystery. It has psychological intrigue, creepy and suspenseful atmosphere, lots of detail, and complex intricacies. And if there's such a thing as a perfect mystery, this is it for me. And last but not least, I have Letters to a Young Poet by Rainer Maria Rilke. I don't think I've talked about this one yet on my channel because I don't think I've talked about what I read in December. I should probably do that at some point. Maybe, maybe not. I'm kind of tempted to just move on and talk about things in January going forwards, but we'll see. Anyway, this is another nonfiction book that made this list. This is a collection of letters from Rilke to a student at a military academy who had sent Rilke some of his verses. These letters were written when Rilke was still quite young and still had much of his best work ahead of him. And instead of properly assessing his poems, Rilke delves into all of these thoughts and responses about life and creating fully and trusting your instincts and letting life unfold around you. It's full of his thoughts on life, love, art, and relationships. And it's really interesting because you only see one side of the letters. You only see what Rilke is writing to the student. You don't see what the student originally wrote to him. And it almost feels, while reading it, like you wrote the letters to Rilke yourself, and that he is responding directly to you. I don't know what gives it that sense of intimacy, but there is this ever-present sense of intimacy that Rilke is writing directly to you. And I only wish that I read this book earlier in life, because I feel like it would have been even more impactful when I was in my early 20s or late teens. Truly the only way that I can do this book justice and express why it is on this list is to read some of Rilke's quotes from this book. I beg you to have patience with everything unresolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves as if they were locked rooms or books written in a very foreign language. Don't search for the answers which could not be given to you now because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything, live the questions now. Perhaps then, someday, far in the future, you will gradually, without even noticing it, live your way into the answer. And one more, because this book is just infinitely quotable. Things aren't all so tangible and sayable as people would usually have us believe. Most experiences are unsayable. They happen in a space that no word has ever entered, and more unsayable than all other things are works of art, those mysterious existences whose life endures beside our own small transitory life. I need to read more Rilke in the future. His work is astounding, thought-provoking, and uh, yeah, I'm still thinking and working through this one. So that is it for today. Those are my favorites of 2020. I'd be very curious to hear in the comments below what were your favorite books of 2020? Did any of them overlap with mine? Have you read any of these favorites of mine? And were they your favorites as well? What did you think of them? Happy reading, and I look forward to seeing you all in another video very soon. Bye.